Welcome back to Voicecraft and to a dialogue with Jamie Wheel. To the world of Wikipedia, Jamie is a writer and co-founder of the Flow Genome Project. He's the author of Recapture the Rapture, Rethinking God, Sex and Death in a World That's Lost Its Mind, and a guide to leaders across multiple areas of high service and performance. In my view, he's a powerful voice in the search for ways to remember, affirm and honour the mystery, the quality and the soul of human experience. In what follows, there's a few terms used in passing that Jamie uses as key frames in Recapture the Rapture, and which will be helpful for listeners to know in advance. That is, meaning 1.0, meaning 2.0, and how the value in each must inform the nature of a meaning 3.0. Meaning 1.0 captures the meaning of organized religion in the sense that those who believed were saved, and those who didn't weren't. Meaning 2.0 in shorthand refers to global liberalism, the idea that, quote, markets, democracy and civil rights would bring us into a world where everyone, not just the elect, were entitled to a fair shot at the good life. For Jamie, Meaning 3.0 seeks a combination of Meaning 1 and 2, fulfilling, quote, the pro-social functions of traditional faith, inspiration, healing and connection, while fulfilling the inclusive promise of modernism, open source, scalable, and anti-fragile. Okay, lots more here. In we go. You write with a lightness, but also a heaviness of emotion. Yeah, like it, I I know it matters to you. And I, and I, there's a profound seeking in it and a lot of finding. So I'm curious how you kind of reflect over the last three years before releasing Recapture the Rapture. How would you how would you summarize the effort of that and how how do you meet the world now in reflection hmm. i mean overall it was it was a, a really fun um fun and intense experience you know so so to birth like i, I don't have experiences like writer's block and and things like that like i knew what i was going to say and it was the hard thing was schedule it was just calming out the time and and then you know lockdowns happily came along so had i not had that my world probably wouldn't have stopped enough for me to get in the sort of three to four hour blocks of time a day but with that i was like all right here we go um so the experience i just wrote non-stop for five months with no notes i was like okay i i, I got to stop researching because I, I was on a deadline and my publisher wouldn't bump it so I was like, ah, oh, fuck, I, I have to ship this thing and I have to come. And I wrote 120,000 words in five months, which I then had to chainsaw down to, you know, 80 or so. Um, so it was a very, and I just had my assistant. I'm like, I know I read this someplace, you know, I'm just going to write the gist right now, go back and find it and we'll true up all the the, the facts and stats. Um, so that was a really fun experience. The, the, I, there were some beautiful, like people who read it and people who read it multiple times or were like, I actually read it while listening to you read it on Audible and I was underlining stuff and, you know, and sort of really felt like they sucked the marrow out of it and got what was deeply intended. And there were also some definite crossed wires where I was like, ah, shit, I shouldn't have made it such a controversial title, you know, recapture the rapture, rethinking God, sex and death in a world that's lost its mind, you know, it's not a neutral book. <laughs> you know, um, and there were there were definitely people who were like, "Wait, are you defending cults?" It's like, "Nope, I'm not." That's why we have a culty cult checklist. Are you advocating for for you know? Are you just a doomer and bummer? Nope, that's why I'm talking about radical hope. Are you you know? And so, in the sense of it, uh, probably not being a Malcolm Gladwell crafted. Here's the one idea I can share with you at a cocktail party kind of book. You know. That I, but, and yet I felt called to do it. I was like, I have to do this end to end and I have to do it between two covers. Otherwise, um, people won't have the, the instruction manual to reboot Gnostic culture and consciousness in case that light ever goes out. So that was my sort of surrendered reason for doing it. I was like, okay, this, this experience has been happening to us and through us. Um, the articulation for this book has been 
five to seven years of voice memos and recordings from liminal zones, you know, coming back, having shot the moon and being like, Kirk to Enterprise, you know, you'll never fucking believe this, right? Like, so, and then mapping it with anthropology and neuroscience and being like, oh yeah, this totally checks out. This is fascinating. And then, you know, and then I shared this with Wade Davis. I, I, I ran this past David Eagleman and Andrew Huberman and a bunch of, you know, friends and colleagues. I was like, um, Mark Hyman, like a bunch of people. I'm like, does this nine step death rebirth, you know, protocol, does this track for you? Because I don't think that anyone has ever necessarily bridged anthropological, mythological descriptions of death rebirth initiatory practices with the actual straight up medical clinical, here's the neuroscience under the hood and done so without assigning any specific, you know, signs and signifiers, assigning meaning, make telling stories about it. It was just like, here's the facts of what happens in our body and brain. You push these buttons in more or less the sequence and you get launched into a, you know, brainstem reboot Delta wave EEG, endocannabinoid bagel activation, you know, slash myofascial, uh, spinal, cerebrospinal uh, energy. And, you know, and, and you too can have a gobsmacking encounter with the ineffable that is profoundly healing, profoundly meaningful, and may even give us a chance to kind of peer around this current train wreck and get some possibly useful or helpful insights <clears throat> into what do we do now? So, you know, this I've just submitted the proposal to, for my next book, uh, which will be kind of the completion of this, what I've loosely thought of as a trilogy of like stealing fire is like, hey, there's something going on on the other side of the river. You know, peak states aren't just for, you know, freaks and misfits. There's the, there's the stealing fire thing, right? Recapture the Rapture was sort of the, you know, the route to advanced base camp. Like, hey, if you actually now you're on this side of the river, right, and you're acquainted with integrating non-ordinary states of consciousness into being and becoming and culture, here's how you here's how you architect the culture around it. And then this this next book will be sort of panning all the way back to what is the nature of life on this earth? What is the nature of consciousness and civilization? And what is an update to human psychology to better be able to integrate all of the wild and woolly in an expanded ontological framework that is actually navigable? Fun. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, if I was trying to build up fucking snappy narrative nonfiction writing career. I would I would chunk these things down and, and I would write these over the next two decades as, as about 10 books with like one or two of the ideas in each one. Hmm. But to me, that's never worth the, the squeeze in the sense that it's always the hop, skip and a jump that gets you to the really interesting insight. And as a, because our shared educational level is so degraded at this point, you have to do a fuck ton of setup to get to a remotely interesting point because you're like, you can't even, you know, I mean, you grew up in England too, right? I mean, the Sunday Telegraph or anything else, like the references to, to Caesar, to Shakespeare, to, to Blake, to whatever you like, like, like there are a thousand dense shorthands in European discourse, you know, and, and, and in America, it's completely flattened and completely in the present moment. So you can't even make movie references from 30 years ago at this point with millennials and, and Gen Zers. They just look at you blankly like, no, I don't know Jaws. No, I don't know E.T. I'm not even interested. That looks old and lame. You're like, oh, fuck, let, let alone classics. So, you know, to get to an interesting idea, to contextualize it in a way that your, you know, your academic colleagues and peers would find credible and, you know, and, and plausible, especially if you're going to hang it out there and say something that, either hasn't been said lately or hasn't been said in a while, while kind of thing. You want to fucking nail down, nail down the edges, but that just takes a minute. You know, hence my sub stacks are often 3000 words instead of 800. <laughs> yeah, I get you. How to bring on the one hand rigor with the expansiveness of genuine openness to mystery is mm -hmm. partly what's in 
and you know and dial it down a level from the utterly banal and cliched absolute truths we're all one there is only right. love light is consciousness you you know it now. all works out right like you can't say that shit with a straight face you got to you got to get back down out of the stratosphere enough to get contrast with the nitty gritty and the yeah. constraints and the ain'ts and then yeah. somewhere in there you have to you know that's where you craft art that isn't just a bumper sticker yeah i get it i think it's a tremendous challenge for books in our time i do think that right because yeah. it's i mean you can give as much as you can and there's a style of prose and you can pour your heart and your energy and your poetry into it but the words don't wake themselves right they're animated by the reader and that reader is often alone and what is that dialogic context that's open to anyone to really relate at that level to move beyond and i know in in your books you do speak about practices for two or more people to engage with but i'm curious in your thinking now and in your upcoming work how much has and even this word i have i have challenged with the word i'm about to say the word scale because to go from things like connection and and heart part of the picture to scale there's a clashing of worlds here and um it's not are, clear are you, are you imagining that i i endorse the word scale or you have you have you read things where i've said something along those lines i wouldn't i i i'm not being like i'm not trying to rough hand you in the sense of like yeah you're endorsing the word scale but you do use the word scale it's it is it is in there um as i think when i'm speaking of idea like using that idea model like open source scalable right. yes. yeah 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 totally right and 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 i get that i mean it's part of and look and this is the <laughs> this is the challenge with seeking language that can relate to more people where almost in very i know you go back deep into history and that that that's beautiful and necessary but if we go back 30 years 40 years or if we're trying to speak to the resonant mimetic communication layer of 15 years ago well maybe it's not as furnished with meaning that might be helpful to use now in speaking about well yes actually there are because here's the thing let me can i can i give you and and please feel free to respond to any of this but i'd love to share with you something of a um of what i feel like is a core tension that i wonder if you're really interested in so i'd like to share this as like a an invitation for mutual exploration and and just share a little bit of how i've related to your presence in a broad conversation among others as holding down right a bit of a stand and i i relate to it i appreciate it i feel the tension of it as well and uh that stand is nicely articulated in what you're trying to keep in the context of both meaning 1.0 and 2.0 particularly in the context of the 2.0 that that more universal that open access right the extended hand in some sense the recognition of the dignity <laughs> of all beings it's a beautiful thing hey that's something we can uh we can we can feel we can affirm we can know and represent through narrative and another narrative that can be positioned at least to be in some tension with that and i think you know they're not don't have to be seen as totally separate but is is for for instance myths of exodus myths of just for me and mine chosen ones to leave this land off to another place i'm not saying these can't be integrated but i notice in some of your recent writing as well there was a substack you posted a couple of weeks ago that was making note of how let's say the liberties that the middle class of let's say the 90s might have come to know and expect where maybe let's say 10% of the population could 
afford that kind of life. Now maybe it's 1% and maybe that margin's narrowing and there's a next inner ring. There's always a next inner ring. There's this sense of in the context of the fracturing and oftentimes kind of, well, propagandistic, schizophrenic, you name it, kind of context in which we meet each other in the digital. There's a real pull to security, to band up with those who we think we can, whether because we can connect to and relate to and do that in some way that aspires to a profound ethics and integrity, or if it's because we can afford, and I know you like to speak about these in your in your journeys of meeting people who are capable of purchasing security teams and and ranches here or there and seeking that private island, that bastion to be that secure thing in the event in the event of some some level of catastrophe or change in the world. There's you know, there's obviously tensions of scale <laughs> in the sense of how much are we in our efforts at seeking to let's say build community and live well, seek out some sustainable ish way of living well today. There's it seems no matter what path we choose, having a recognition for the reality of membranes is really important. I'm not putting forward any, I'm not trying to state what my perspective is here in any of this. I'm just trying to share some things as a kind of context for tension that I wonder if you think about and just, just you know, bottom line it for me, because you, 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 you've teased this a couple of times. It, it's as if you've sensed something either in what I've, some things I've said or written, and you're wondering whether I resolve attention or whether I'm aware of attention or, or what's my understanding of what, what, what is the tension in particular? Is it the sort of the intimate and the communal versus the quote unquote scalable and global and does the intimate and when and how does the intimate and communal be something sincere versus just pulling the escape hatch with privilege? Yeah, you know, I, I, I like, I like all of that. Just to read out a couple of quotes, like um, one is, from the book, we should recapture the rapture because solutions that only work for a tiny fraction of us wreak havoc for the rest, right? So there is a very, so the sense I get from you is that there is no, <laughs> there's no pathway through that doesn't recognize the effects on the whole that we're all involved. There's that very real tension there. But what I'm also saying is that we are seeing in many different areas of movement, energy, identity in society, an attitude that does look a lot, a lot more like, let's go this way with a chosen group. It's more some kind of exodus and fuck everyone else. That seems to be like a tension I've recognized you relate with. So that's one piece, but I'm also curious to like ask about, you know, and explore together where in your own efforts at understanding, for instance, how to, you know, this work of wanting to offer and invite and, and, and guide people in a way of, you know, not taking too much of a forerunning leadership, but certainly there's an, there's an element of how you show up that is pro provisioning a handbook, a guidebook for individual becoming, partner becoming, small group becoming, I haven't quite yet engaged with your work in the sense of what does it look like in the cult, like in the cultural aspect, what does it look like when we rate, relate to the systems that we're a part of? That seems, that seems to me to be something that would be on the pulse for what follows recapture the rapture. For instance, how has your in last three years book. been? Yeah, right. a revival of bioregional tribalism you know, based on not just biomimicry, but geomimicry. So how do we do basically highly engineered, low tech solutions for the bottom 4 billion humans, right? So that the future, if we have one, I, I would predict, you know, the, I, you know, even, I, I wouldn't even say idealize just the best possible that I could conceive of is going to be much more 
Buckminster Fuller meets Swiss Family Robinson, right? Or Gilligan's Island, right? So it's like 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 doing rigging cool shit with natural materials, you know, mostly. Um, then it's going to look like Star Trek meets Elon Musk because the insanely expensive, incredibly rarefied, unstable, high embedded energy, highly engineered, irreplaceable shit is a privilege of late stage fossil fuel capitalism that we may or may not hang on to. And even if we do, it's it becomes so upside down resource intensive to continue forging those things that there's simply no way that the bottom four or five billion folks will ever see any of it. So what would it be like to, you know, the boy who built the windmill, that famous TED talk about the the young African kid, right? Who figured out, you know, I think he somehow had biked to an internet cafe and figured out plans and built a little windmill to power the light and power the cell phone charger for his family. Like, what does it mean to have a water purifier, some form of Wi-Fi access and some form of, you know, non-combustible lighting, right? So compact LEDs and possibly super bonus round, some form of cooling in a really getting warmer world, you know, and can we do that with also a revival of natural building materials, everything from those wild ass vertical windmills that they have in Iran that are like 2000 years old to, you know, earth, you know, can, can we, can we come up with rammed earth? I mean, we have, there's plenty of folks in the permaculture space already doing this, but can we scale it? Can we actually add some industrial efficiencies to, you know, mud and bamboo rebar with a little bit of fixatives instead of Portland cement, you know, that, that, that has to be baked in a kiln at 1500 degrees, you know, like that there's all sorts of amazingly ingenious, cool and inspiring infrastructure things for us to do. And then there's also the cultural layer on top of that which is, you know, and then how do we gather? How do we grieve? How do we arbitrate and govern ourselves? How do we engage in reconciliation? How do we engage in resource trade-offs? I mean, I don't know if you know Liz Bury. She's the, that English uh, hooker player and game, theor game theorist. And I was on her podcast, which I think she even calls win-win games, right? It's this kind of inquiry into how do we find more of those? And I'm I'm honestly under convinced. I think I think that win-win games, literally, if you just kind of just do the basic logic of it, they only work in a place of resource abundance. Because if there is not enough to go around, it becomes win-lose. It becomes one up, one down, all the way all the way down to single cells, live or die, right? And win-lose can be: Do I get my the first name? on the published academic paper, because that's going to boost my chances of getting tenure or getting funding. Win loses. Do, do I get the likes and the clicks and the retweets on social media? Because that does something for me, right? Like, you know, or mating fitness or whatever, but it all comes down to life death. And so my sense is we actually just need to get, before we start thinking of highfalutin, you know, utopian visions where humans are suddenly no longer human or animal, and we all just kumbaya it all. Um, can we get better at playing win-lose games more kindly and equitably? Can we get better at treating the losers of win-lose games um, you know, more justly? Can we pipe less bullshit about, um, about the nature of our games? Like if the United States was like, you know what? White people are more valuable to us than brown people. Our people are more important to us than your people. Your shit we tend to take as potentially our shit and our shit you don't get to touch. Now, we also think we'll give you money. We'll help you stand up on your feet. We'll we'll put it. We'll prop up your you know your leaders that we like, are favorable. Let us keep doing business and having stable access to our investments and your your raw materials. Like this is the game we're playing. Can we at least just fucking name it? And then and then let's be held accountable to our stands. So so you know because the notion of blind altruism in, in the midst of resource scarcity, I think, is Codswallop. Well you know, it's like, it, it, it's a saint, right? It's a bodhisattva to say, hey, eat of my body, right? You're hungry. I don't need it. It's a psychopath that says, let me chop my kids up and feed them to you and your kids, right? So the moment, like you can have an individual who has attained a level of consciousness, who know, who, who, is, who is in full infinite compassion and has no particular um, protectionism, of identity or or selfhood or even you know bodily health and viability great so the saint can make the sacrifice play 
but no one in their right mind, quite literally, will sacrifice the viability of their own children for some stranger's children halfway around the world or at the barbed wire fence. It's going to be me and mine. It is genetically tribally encoded, and it should be. So, right. So, I feel like it's super critical to sort of, there are so many, whether it's NFTs and crypto platforms or whether it's some form of you know, pretty much, you know, effective acceleration and the AGI fantasies, you know, or it's burn it all down. We're creating a neo Marxist, socially just, you know, multi ethnic state or, or ethnic, ethno state, you know, you name it. There's, Everything is splintering at this point, and everybody has got their perfect idealized solution if we just can wait, wipe the slate clean and not deal with any of this messiness, you know, and then we'll get to really build what's going to work. And, and every time I hear them, I just think, fucking hell, that's another rapture ideology. Those don't end well, and they never play out the way you think. And we're now getting accelerationists, you know, not just the techno ones of like, wait until the mighty god of AGI tells us how to fix all this. Um, but also the kind of the Sith Lords, the Steve Bannons of the world who are, you know, actively saying, let us drive American democracy off a cliff and let's set up a monarchy, a feudal state, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a fascist resurgence. You're like, no, wow, this is getting really dodgy. And the entire enlightenment liberal experiment is being sort of, you know, it's been shivved a thousand times and left for dead by the road. And you're like, holy fuck, people. Um, I'm really, I mean, it makes you sound like, okay, boomer. To be like, wait a second, we shouldn't forget some really important stuff. And right, and, you know, and and the social justice folks are like, burn it all down. You know, all of those liberal values were just stalking horses for tyranny and oppression and racism and all the isms and schisms. And then you've got the far right being like, burn it all down. That was just a protection for all you snowflakes, right? And might makes right and the Roman Empire, right? <laughs> and all of that stuff. And in between, you're like, well, you know, and, and I, I don't, I'm sure you've read uh, Graeber's, David Graeber's stuff, yeah? Right? So between him and there's a woman, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, she's a Ojibwe woman who wrote a beautiful book called Braiding Sweetgrass. And it's all about indigenous ways of knowing and relating to the natural world. So super sweet. It's, I kind of see that and Tyson Yunker Porter's Sand Talk is they're, they're, they're a kick-ass matched set. But you remember that in Graeber's Dawn of Everything, right? He makes a pretty interesting case that many European Enlightenment values actually came from the Huron, came from the Haudenosaunee, came from other indigenous tribes. And at the first lapse of colonialism, fur trade, et cetera, they were basically like, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not seeing what's so fancy about you French or you British. You treat your soldiers like shit. You only govern them with the lash. They are only listening to you because of fear of death and pain. And by the way, and I think some of them had even visited Paris by that point, and they're like, and your cities are filthy and you have people that have no homes. Where are their families? How horrible are you guys to each other that you have homeless and derelicts and people in prison? Like, what is going on with you guys? And it was that dialogue with the philosophers of Turtle Island that then sharpened up French thinking. And they did all those books where they were like, you know, I, I went and talked, you know, they basically used as a mouthpiece the noble savage to then say things within monarchical Europe that they wouldn't have been able to get away with otherwise. And then Robin Wall Kimmerer has a, has a super cool origin story of uh, the Potawatomi up in the Great Lakes in, in, in America, where there's a story of like first man, and he's kind of one of those sort of trickster explorer guys. And he comes across a village and there, you know, the kids are all nappy and crusty and scabbed and they're covered with flies. And, and he sort of comes and he's like, where the hell is the adult supervision here? And all the grownups are blissed out of their fucking trees, basically free basing maple syrup straight out of the trees. And they're just sugar hide and they don't give a fuck. Right. And he's like, what are you guys doing? And so he's like, well, this doesn't, this doesn't fly. So he scoops up, you know, he's a superhero, right? So he scoops up this birch bark basket and floods and dilutes all of the maple trees. So now the maple syrup is 40 times weaker and you have to gather it and collect it and boil it assiduously and boil it down and boil it down and boil it down to ever get to the super sweet stuff, 
which is basically Max Weber's Protestant work ethic in a fucking Native American story, which is don't be a lazy cunt, right? You got to work, right, for your stuff. So if you just take those two stories, you're like, wait a second, those Enlightenment ideals cannot simply be dismissed as dead white males, hegemony, patriarchy, and racism as a stalking horse. You're like, these are fucking human qualities that we value and value and espouse by a fluke of history, right? They happen to get expressed and traction in the books that we know and name with Hobbes and Locke and everybody, you know, and Rousseau and Descartes and everybody else just so happens. But these are universalist values that arguably belong to the world and to humanity. And we are absolutely stuffed if we, in our pain and contortions and trauma and need to blame and scapegoat another, burn those down and think that what either side of the finite game, you know, the tribal identities on, on both sides of the political spectrum, think that either expressions of that are going to do us better than a humble curious, cautious attempt to reboot. You know, what if we just said, hey, 1700 to now was a really good beta test. Let's debrief the hell out of it. All of the lessons learned and let's get going on a proper version one, right? And do this better, not trash it altogether. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm I mean, there's a lot of different currents in that wave, but I feel like I'm on that wave. I am, you know, I can certainly speak from the mess and the you know, paradox would be a nice way to put it. But the, con you say the contradictions, the double standards, the, and I like your insistence on life and death. Yeah, I, I. I feel that I can speak from the mess that is navigating the distributed, constellating, socio-cultural space of people talking about variants of some of this, mm -hmm. some of whom have money to fund things to do stuff some who don't, some who need it, some who deserve it, probably some who deserve it less in terms of their capacity to, let's say, you know, build at least some kind of ship with more or less holes in it to get somewhere to stay with the wave for a little bit. I can speak from the... So, so something I've felt for a long time, and this sort of characterized a lot of my direction before coming into contact with any of the names we might know in common and point to as people who are known in this sort of exploration. Before I came into touch with any of that, I was acutely aware of how difficult it was for me growing up, but also then as a young adult to find places where it was possible to stay in the wonder, but also the uncertainty and challenge and tension of real communication about who we are, what mattered, all of this stuff. You know, you've shared a lot there and I more or less get what you're talking about, but there's a lot there. And, and I say that from a perspective of awareness of my own embodied relation to it and commitment in relation to lots of it, not from just an intellectual perspective, right? And that helps me because I can look around and I can be grounded in some effort of relating to that. For the most part, when we enter into interaction, dialogue, just name any one of these issues, you just touch on some social justice, cultural aspect, just touch on one of them, and we're touching on what might be, let's say, the sacred cow, I know that's a word you use, like a very front and center, at least to the conscious mind, identity that really matters, 
to those people and sort of fuck the rest of it. We've got to make sure that we're resonating in the frequency of whatever goes along with that worldview or not. Well, it's very difficult. Are Go you just saying I was sort of tiptoeing through the, the no. minefield there? Uh, yeah, well, in a sense, I mean, I wouldn't say you were tiptoeing. I would say it sounds a lot more like you have a sense of what you're bringing in and where you're advocating is a direction. It doesn't feel like a tiptoe to me. I think you've done it a few too many times for us to call it a tiptoe, you know. <laughs> but um, it's in the bare ass naked run. It's a sprint. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, in the context then of the tiptoe, Actually, it's very difficult to, let's say, do it publicly in a way that communicates a signal that is genuinely welcoming of the kind of diversity of interaction associated with the scale that you're talking about, right? And that's fine. It's, it's not on you to do it all. I'm not saying that. And it can't be on anyone to appeal to everyone. Absolutely not. But it would seem to me that the degree to which communication is more open speaks across more membranes then it's playing in the it's playing that game it's like um how much are you speaking to one base or another how shamanically open is the communication to actually hold open a channel of generative pluralistic and not just discourse energetic exchange orientation for action all this right and so what I've noticed, just to go back then, you know, that it's very difficult to access these types of spaces in life, in most people's lives, in universities, you know. I mean, quality dialogue is not a part of the university experiences I had. You might find the odd teacher, but for the most part, um, I got glimpses and recognize tremendous lack, tremendous lack. Now, there's very understandable reasons for this, of course, because so much, I mean, we could name so many, whether it's because we have a, you know, a relatively exalted position in some hierarchy of thought, of institutional position. There's all those, let's say, power games associated with various echelons of society, discourse, and in the context of culture making, in the context of people who want to do good, who read people like Jamie Will and others, or at least quote Jamie Will and others, right? And many, many, many people. I'm curious, it, for me, you know, one of the things I most want to see and one of the things I'm most trying to contribute to is, well, how, like, should there be more efforts at, I think there should be more efforts at taking on the project of communication, of, of interaction, of dialogue, of these types of things. I know, I know they're out there and what have you, but that's, I guess I'm just bringing in part of, part of some of where I feel the most lack is with respect to anything approaching scale of these types of ideas. I know there's builders and innovators and people experimenting with stuff all over the place. I know many of them and people are going to do that and that's great. But the, the mentality that contracts into me and mine in a way that is less compatible with participation in a, if not totally globalized world, in principle, the kind of world that can be globalized by someone, then it seems like we have to participate in the kind of sharing of identity and, and, sh and, and sharing an identity, of course, you'd maybe associate with what's most important. Well, I mean, in terms of both meaning 1.0 and 2.0, and you've, you speak about what is best in traditional religions and what have you, and, and there's plenty to bring in there. So that's what sort of comes from me in terms of hearing you share all of that and sort of where I am in relation and how I'm trying to coordinate to you in that context. <laughs> Clear as mud. Um, yeah, well, look, I mean, 
if I'm if I'm tracking, I mean, you're you're coming back to that that theme of scale and community, or withdrawing and separating, and then you were speaking. It felt to me like you were speaking somewhat of cultural critique that may alienate some people that you might otherwise actually want to be reaching as people as humans. Um, yep. And then some, you know, what I you know posited as as um, Satyagraha soul force, right, in the book, and for me. On a lot of podcasts, I will end up being pretty ruthless um, on the disillusioning people at a rate they can handle, right? Because the discourse right now is so utterly fucked and so profoundly juvenile, impulsive, reactive, non-rigorous, and and wildly unhelpful that yes, there then then it's the sort of manjushri, right? It it it's it's Chunkpa's notion of like true compassion versus idiot compassion. Idiot compassion would be like, hey, everyone, I know we're all out here wondering how we're doing. And it's like, no, no, like that personal growth, magical thinking, psychedelic renaissance, conchi conchi, we don't need to get our jabs because we're going to vibrate to the fifth density. And maybe there's going to be a, a bifurcation in humanity and we're on the good, we're on the happy spaceship. So let's go to Bali and, and Costa Rica. No, no, fuck you. That, that is, that is insufferable. You know, and for militant social justice folks, you're like, look, you guys have the moral high ground. You want dispossessed, marginalized people to be treated with humanity, right? And to have a fair share of the pie. Stay there. Don't go fucking it up with some retread Marcuse, Marcusean, you know, the only solution to racism is is more racism directed back at the oppressor. Don't, you know, like like what we're seeing in, in Gaza right now, like don't lose the moral high ground. And, 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 and to me, there's, you know, this is, this is everything from a Buddhist notion, you know, uh, but it's also echoed in uh, Jewish thought as well. But, you know, the idea of like the pre-tragic, the tragic and the post-tragic, and most social discourse right now is we've been slamming into the tragic, and that's everything from lockdowns to George Floyd to environmental despair to the poly crisis, right? Ah, this isn't, you know, this isn't what I was promised, you know, growing up in the developed world. I was promised, you know, a rose garden and, and a golden watch after 20 years and, you know, and a career ladder and, and a house down payment. Um, so there's all sorts of demagogues. And I would count everyone from Ibram Kendi, you know, and and uh, Robin, what's her bucket, D'Angelo, as as the the viruses on the social justice side. But you've got Trump, you've got you've got Bolsonaro, you've got a bunch of sketchy authoritarians on the right, all promising and whispering to their people, you can come back to the pre-tragic, where you have it all, right? And we're gonna get it from those baddies that have done us dirty. And so that is, those are finite games. And, and, and the case I make in the book without getting sucked into the culture wars is they're both on the same team. Even though they see themselves as cast enemies, they're actually on team finite game, win, lose, up, down, and that will destroy us all. So taking the idea of like, hey, we have to sit in the tragic a little bit. We have to sit in the complexity of sorting out this world and what on earth is going on and what do we do next? And yes, I am going to hack through the brambles pretty ruthlessly because I don't even tend to, I tend to, I intend to stay here as for as little time as is absolutely required to potentially get to the simplicity on the far side of complexity, which might be the post-tragic. Okay. This is, this is deeply fucked. The hour's late and the stakes are high and the odds are low. Are we all square? Now let's get up and sing our songs. Now let's get up and plant those orchards. Now let's get up and open that soup kitchen. Let's go. Like, like there are there are no guarantees as to how this all turns out. But right, I mean, Ellie Wiesel, you name it, right? I mean, you know, like it's our response to the stimulus. Then that, that, that therein lies our humanity and our dignity. And paradoxically, slash, makes great sense. You know, the best chance of pulling this off if we can. So for me, and and I'll get dinged on that, right? I'll get I get, I get you know my tendency is cynical Englishman, right? So, so you know, in my default, I'm going to come across taking the piss out of stupid shit. Can't help it, right? But then if you get, if we get anywhere near the threshold of 
soul force, then it's a completely different energy. And it's like, okay, so now, right, can we take heart and find courage? Right? Can we live beyond ourselves on behalf of others? Right? Can we, you know, fundamentally seek refuge in the Dharma? It's just that our particular Dharma in this particular lifetime at this historical moment is a doozy. But would we have it any other way? Right? And so if it's people stuck in ego games, I'm going to show up pretty ruthless and cynical and critical. If it's people in vulnerable, tender humanity. And I mean, I was just, a, I was just part of a uh, kind of a speaker series. It was, it was what's called imagining or something regenerative futures. And it had Jem Bendel and Douglas Rushkoff and a, a bunch of people that I, you know, know and respect. And, and I was listening to, you know, to all of them. I kind of made a point to uh, listen in and learn from, I just was like, okay, this is a cool gathering of people around the world doing heartfelt, sincere stuff. God bless every one of them. And in that particular framework, I took the, I'm going to emphasize optimism because I know this, I know that several speakers are going to tell you we are utterly fucked within the next decade. Write your will. You know, I don't expect to die of old age. You know, it's going to be war, famine, mayhem coming. So I was like, so, so I was over in the other perspective. So I, I mean, I try to do my best to be, to be, you know, like, like a rhythm guitarist, you know, if, if someone's up front, playing, you know, playing with their teeth and setting the thing on fire. I'm going to chunk some nice background chords. I'm going to try and find some spaces or some melodies to occupy that are perhaps not already getting hammered, you know, so that whoever's listening just has one more data point, one more counterfactual to, to mull over, you know, without collapsing the waveform and being like, this is what I, this is what's going to happen, or this is what I think is going to happen. I'd rather create sort of orthogonal thought experiments. So people were like, oh, this is kind of a fun and slightly entertaining journey to go on. And at the end of it, I have one more frame or model in my kit, or I've run a virus scan and I'm probably not, I'm not quite as buggy as I, as I was going in. And then I'm better at making, at figuring this out for myself. That would be my hope. I almost never say what I actually think. <laughs> But that doesn't mean I duck what I care about. It just means I don't, you know, like my opinions as a person aren't relevant to, you know, like who would I vote for or what's going on here or there. Like I only kind of, you know, I try and stay at one meta level on the balcony. I get it. I can relate to that. And it's of course not enough because <laughs> you have relationships I'm sure with, with your family, with your close friends, they want to get a little bit closer to the real Jamie than can be expressed or appro you know, appropriately expressed in the context of showing up in the cultural conversation, right? And, and it's in the mess of navigating that. So I, I'm here actually with you in the mess of navigating the relation between those because I'm not doing this for the sake of the public expression only it's there it's there but not only right and if it if it was only that how could in some sense we trust anything we were doing in in relation to that i would kind of i can affirm your game i'm gonna speak some words that play the game of what that is where does that where does that ground what are we accountable to at the end of the day which way do we vote all these types of things and i have myself written things and said things in the past in service of opening up perspectives on how to relate to voting rather than as an attempt to convince people to vote one way or another about a particular issue. In fact, an extremely sensitive one here in Australia, the, um, the referendum we had a couple months ago, funnily enough, called The Voice. I don't know if you know much about that. But I, 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 I feel that I hear, I hear where you're coming from. Well, dude, I mean, you know, as far as the bridging the gap, I mean, like the people I know and love, you know, we'll go backcountry skiing, we'll go to show and catch great music, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go 
kite kite surfing you know like like that's how, how i actually like to spend my time um this stuff is just what's whizzing around in my brain um pretty much all the time and therefore i need to metabolize it um into words so that it doesn't keep spinning around i'm like okay at least i fucking took a crack at it now i can right. set it aside you know and and my my entire life and career has been as a as a teacher you know literally up there with chalk and like telling stories and drawing pictures on boards and being like hey history culture anthropology science you know and you know and then and then outdoor guiding like let's go play in beautiful wild environments and learn more out there so me on zooms and me doing the like head on a stick thinky thought guy is is sort of my least favorite way to spend time but as far as like getting down into the messy and the human i mean honestly man i mean i haven't a clue i am more confused and more heartbroken um at this point in time than probably ever ever there's only so i feel like i've kind of run a fairly high speed search function, you know, including all the way through undergrad, graduate school, like just fucking nonstop. How did we get here? Where did we go wrong, if anywhere? So that's the whole, you know, anthropological backtracks, you know, what were there forks in the road we should go back and grab? Is it always forward, et cetera, et cetera? What are the state of things? And where do we go from here? And I've sort of broken my brain and broken my heart at this point. You know, people come to me asking, hey, okay, okay, I'm picking up your signal. This seems fresh, clean, grounded, fun, whatever they experience. Um, you must know the secret. <laughs> you know, like what's next or what's behind the curtain? And it's like, look, um, I honestly have no idea what happens next. I think I could lay with almost, you know, I would say solid 90% certainty it's going to involve a meaningful step down in stability and standards of living just at the level of material energy physics and an assessment just EROI on hydrocarbons versus anything else complex dissipative structures and how can we keep this whole crazy late stage civilizational circus going without those practically free inputs of hydrocarbons and the answer is complex dissipative structures dissipate when you turn off the taps you know and and what happens to our geopolitics to our stability to our care and concern for our neighbors to our food security to the sustainability of our ecosystems because war is dirty as fuck you know like we can make all of our maps and models about how quickly chinese people are buying teslas you know and that's like a super duper best case but war is dirty as fuck you know, and 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 our, and we're not being very nice to our neighbors. We're getting increasingly not nice really early in this game. You know, because we've got the demagogues on the right, juning it up to gain power and to stoke fear. It's not that Trump Trump wasn't wrong when he was talking about migrants at the wall and migrant caravans and all this stuff. He was just absolutely cynically using it to get votes. And as he did, but he he was just early. He was just about five to ten years early because without a doubt you know all those un reports on you know a deg another degree of warming you know basically removes 30 percent of the world from habitable bands around the planet you're like we are going to be a migratory species once more just as we were before the holocene right i mean the holocene kicks in 10 or eleven thousand years ago and we went from plus or minus 10 degrees celsius every decade to plus or minus one degree Celsius in 10,000 fucking years. Like ergo civilization, you know, we went from, from running around in furs and trying to dodge ice, you know, ma you know, mastodons and glaciers to posting up and planting crops and building shit, you know? And so, and so the fact that we're getting to be plus or minus three degrees Celsius, you're like, we will be, I mean, and this is true for people of means. There are people who summer somewhere and they winter somewhere because they can. And there's also, you know, action sports athletes who chase swells or snow or whatever around the world because they love to and or they're good enough that they get, you know, backing to. There's migrant workers that are already doing this. You know, the entire North America is a ton of people from the Mexican border coming up. They start picking in Southern California in February and they finish in September in Washington state and British Columbia, and they go back down and do it again. So like those notions of 
migration, mobility, what, you know, steps down in standards of living, um, increased ethno-nationalism, um, possible food shortages and all those things. It will happen. It won't happen evenly. It won't happen evenly by geography. It won't happen even, it definitely won't happen evenly by class. The wealthiest will be able to buffer themselves the best, right? Just as with COVID, I mean, I don't know if this was true in Australia, but like in North America, if you were flying a private plane, you could come and go wherever the fuck you wanted. You were in different terminals. You could cross international borders. You could do all sorts of shit as, as a rich person with a PJ than you could going into the airport terminals. It was nutty and it was just fine. And that, and that, and those kinds of, you know, differentials or, or yeah, pressure gradients, right. Will persist. But I mean, I think the best case is, is a, we're not going to turn this, we're not going to turn it around because we just simply don't have the incentives or the will or the coherence to, and all the places we would have thought like CDCs, WHOs, UNs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, NATOs, they're all fracturing and trust in all those institutions is going utterly tits up at a time that you would massively need them to be the North stars that everyone rallied around. So that's out. And we're going to bumble into this. There will be some things that get better in spite of ourselves, like population recovery over the next century. It'll be too slow to avoid the initial crunch, but you know, we will wind down from 10 billion and we will come back down to 8 billion by about 2100. And then it'll go steadily down from there if all other things stay equal. So we're naturally self-correcting on that, but it'll be too little too late. We are naturally transitioning off beef, at least in younger generations in the United States. Baby boomers eat the most beef, right? And and millennials and younger are eating more chicken, more fish, more whatever, whatever. So, so beef consumption is naturally declining. We are naturally wasting less nitrogen and fertilizers in developed Western countries because it's expensive. It's getting increasingly expensive and agricultural efficiencies and monitors and sensors are going up. So these things are happening in the sort of invisible hand of the market slash demographic sense. But in no way are we going to transition off fossil fuels? Best case, we get it down to 50% or 30% dependence. Best case spectrum would be like 30% fossil fuels, 30% renewables, 30% large and small nukes, and 10%, you know, emergent tech slash shit we can't see from here, you know, like carbon sequestration or whatever else the hell comes down the line. But again, none of that stuff that's in the 10% bucket is going to be ready for prime time and scale in time to avoid this first hit, this sort of this first crash landing. And we will then mitigate the effects of those decisions. And we will it will cost way more money to clean shit up and fix stuff than it would have to prevent it in the first place. It will create way more disruptions, dislocations, and human suffering than if we'd been all in it together. And we will continue bumbling along this path exactly as we are, like the Club of Rome, right? I mean, the, the limits to growth predictions in 1972, they had, you know, as they all do, the kind of high middle, high middling low, you know, projections of like, if we get our shit together and we're really smart, if we kind of get our shit together, if we don't change a fucking thing, right? And we, and, and there was a KPMG revisiting of the limits to growth study in 2020. So KPMG, I mean, this is not, this is not Greenpeace, right? And they plugged in all fresh data. They're like, okay, you know, we've got, we've got more information now. Let's run it. Supercomputers, not punch cards. And they're like, yeah, we're exactly on track for the, we did fuck all worst case trend of the limits to growth modeling at MIT in 1972. And you're like, yeah, that's pretty much what we're doing. Like there's all sorts of cool and interesting things happening. And like Hannah Ritchie just wrote a book called It's Not the End of the World. And she's from the Hans Rosling, Max Roser School of like Our World in Data. And like good-hearted, well-intentioned humans. But she also smuggled a shit pile under the rug in that book, you know, where she's basically, the, 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 the TLDR of it is don't bother going organic and local because it's lower carbon footprint to shop you know, transnational and commercial. Don't bother not using your plastic bag at the shopping center because your cloth one, unless you use it for years and years and never throw it away, actually has more energy in it. Don't bother, you know, like like it's 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 so many things where she's basically just saying, trust neoliberalism. It's getting there. You know? And I know that's not her total intent, but then when you're like, oh wait, the Musk Foundation is sponsoring you guys, Bill Gates is sponsoring you guys. Like, and I get that they believe and feel that they have academic sort of data independence. 
nor are they saying like Vaclav Schmil would or someone else who's like, yeah, man, renewables. And I mean, until you can make solar panels, batteries and windmills from the energy that you produce from solar panels, batteries and windmills, this is a fancy science fair project. You know, and if you, if you read stuff on like, how, what does it take to make a silicon chip transistor? It's mind bending. It is mind bending. I mean, they heat those things to 1500 degrees twice over the levels. They're down to angstrom level, almost, you know, practically quantum level engineering um, in clean rooms in safe. Like, like the fact that the Chinese haven't been able to rip off the Taiwanese. They literally cannot get to the 10th decimal point purity that is required for definitely all this artificial intelligence, like the super, super high-end transistors. And they haven't been able to because the Chinese first wave of students that came into the West to go to grad school and things came back and they built Samsung and they built all these hardware companies. The subsequent generation built Alibaba, built WeChat and built TikTok. They've been building apps. So they literally have a, and, and so the gap between Taiwanese semiconductor intelligence and sophistication hasn't been getting closed like you would think it was you're like oh chinese can knock off anything like that is their that is their playbook for the last 70 years instead taiwan has actually been gaining ground and getting further and further ahead of them so you know hence uh you know S S south china sea instability in the next five to ten years also so you're like okay so to me none of this stuff is quote unquote solvable mm -hmm. so the only solution that i could possibly come to and it's consistent theme in each book like stealing fire was like hey there's always been the priests and the prometheans our only hope is to steal fire and open source it to humanity right and that keeps the flame going and a recapture it was sort of like hey any way you slice this it doesn't look like it pencils out except if we find a way to keep the light of human consciousness and culture burning and we are able to bring it through whatever constraint, whatever keyhole event may be coming, such that subsequent generations can rekindle the fire. And to me, that's the orientation. It's it's is how do you build lifeboats that become star arcs? You know, how do how do we become like that Svalbard seed bank, you know, where you're like, let's get all the heirloom seeds, let's put them in one place, such if there is a cataclysm, we have the ability to reseed the garden. And what is that at a cultural level? And can we embed both memory, and that's songs, art, scriptures, whatever, you know, philosophies, right, that we can re get, you know, re refine and, and remember, just the same way the Renaissance, right, was kicked off by finding Plato and Aristotle on Irish monks' vellum, you know, in transcripts. And it wasn't until the 15th century they even fucking remotely got close to the original Roman recipe for, for concrete. Right. The, the the Pantheon is the largest to this day, largest unbridged, you know, unsupported concrete span ever built. And it was with Roman recipes. And it was and it was rediscovering those recipes that kicked off the entire Renaissance, both in the world of ideas and philosophy, and then also just straight up material science. So how do we keep that stuff alive and some remembrance of our shared humanity and divinity and you know to me that's it it's the sort of abandoned hope all you who enter and are you still up for it and if you're still up for it then then we're not going to buckle when it gets hard because we knew going into it and we have a better chance of keeping our hearts open and our heads up yes that does come through in the book <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, but I mean, but like the, the, honestly, the whole reason I wrote that book, that is just one massive bowler's wind up to the conclusion. The conclusion is what I actually wanted to say. I get it. You know, but I felt like I had to snip all the wires to the bombs to then have permission slash credibility or whatever you'd want to say in order to be able to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. There's like a good eight to 10 different things I would absolutely love to say. Well, pick one. I'll probably pick four or five. There you go. <laughs> they'll, all, uh, they'll all vie. 
You know, it's interesting. I've found that the, you use the language of soul force. Even the language of soul force, the very name of that, that's, uh, that's a difficult sell at the beginning of a book, the beginning of meeting some institutional context, the beginning of connecting a little bit more with people embedded in society who have resources and power and respect from the perspective of a 32 year old man you can't always lead with the soul force well i mean you can in the sense of what is coming out of your heart and mouth you i get that name. and i do i get that i get that but it's interesting i mean i i feel like there's um there's there's so much how old are you, Jamie? 50. 50. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, I imagine you as someone, you know, and I understand you to be someone in terms of you've written about it and you, and you speak to it. I imagine you as someone who has taken out countless hundreds, if not thousands of various CEOs, people from different echelons of society, people who can afford or value it, either value it high enough, or maybe it's less down their value hierarchy, but they can afford to just take the trip of going with you on an adventure. And I'm sure they're extremely worthwhile for many people. I, I mean that. You know, in that context, and in speaking at conferences, and in speaking at festivals, in places as well where I know you have a tremendous, you know, difference and you see a lot of bullshit in many of the places. Interestingly, you're someone who does in fact speak to a lot of bullshit in places where there is bullshit, but they still value you. That's what it looks like from my perspective. And that's, that's awesome. You know, that's, that's really quite something. There aren't that many people who do that, but in these, in these contexts, you know, I have little tastes of this, you know, I, but in these contexts where you're the man to go on an adventure with, who will be looking after you and he'll be someone who can speak very much as the guide up the mountain, you physically, as well as in the context of what we're speaking about here, if we, you know, speak to a bit more of the, do you call you know, the very language of hedonic engineering is the kind of language that I think is effective to communicate to more people. And yet it speaks from a certain poetic angle and not the whole of the poetic angle of what it is to actually be, if we can say, in service of what you also refer to as democratizing transcendence. There are the, it, it's interesting there would be so much, there's, it's, it feels to me there's so much um, ripeness for learning in paying attention to the social dynamics associated with how people relate to you about these topics and the, the openness that affords you to weave the discourse, to weave the communication, to influence the psychological field so as to make relatable and metabolizable and attractive all at the same time the process of staying with the tremendous depth of risk and danger you know, and kind of impending, not, so not so much danger, like be careful not to steer off the cliff, but it looks like we're going off the cliff, danger. And then to hold a presence of, ah, actually it turns out we can come back right here to the here and now. It turns out here we are as people connecting with each other. And in fact, there's so much beauty all around us and all of that. <laughs> And we can realize that together. And in fact, we can support each other to cultivate our capacity to know and to name and to play with it and all of that right now. 
And it turns out what we wanted to do really was have a bit of a walk. You know, some people might like to be more strenuous in their activity than that. And then sit down at a table and eat some food and have a talk and then go to sleep. Maybe do some other things in between. I get that. The, the, uh, it's not so much the light at the end of the tunnel, that simplicity on the other side of the complexity. The reality is we can be with that simplicity on the other side of complexity right now to the degree we are really showing up and being present to relationship, being present to meeting and knowing each other and sharing in creation together and the healing and all the rest of it. It's not so easy. And it, it takes a feel to hold a feel, right? So you can absolutely you you can shazam people into stillness, suchness via just resonance, pointing out instructions, a well timed bitch slap or bell chime, <laughs> right? Um, a, a stomping great hit on a fucking blunt, you know, whatever, right? And, and and you know, or the drop in the music, or you know, there are a bunch of ways to get into Kairos, into yeah. deep deep time. The trick is our goal is to lead leaders and to teach teachers and to heal healers. So we are a community of people who lead their communities. So we only coalesce for trainings in bounded time, knock the hell out of people, right? Put them through their paces, train them in martial arts, train them in acro yoga, train them in philosophy and theory, train them in relational work, train them in music and song and voice, like, like, Hey, here's how we do the human thing. Right. So like if recapture the rapture is a sort of open source toolkit, we're like, we're going to show you one instantiation. We are the people who literally wrote the book about it. So we have a few ideas, <laughs> you know, it didn't just come out of nowhere. So, but we are only, we're going to show you just our best hack at it. If you like it, fucking fantastic. You know, let, let, let's keep doing it. If you, if you want to modify it, tweak it, tune it, but it's, it's very explicitly leaving the throne unclaimed for Elijah. We're like, hey, look, we've seen culty cults before. We've seen what happens when someone speaks logos, when someone creates a resonant field. Most groups lose their fucking minds. This doesn't seem super helpful. You know, the pedestal in the pit, like, fuck, they're both fucked, right? So how about we do this in an open source, post-conventional way, which means no one's going to grab the ring slash the throne, we're going to be developmental, developmentally learn, learning, like our pedagogy, right, is constructivist action learning. You learn by doing, you figure some shit out. This is kind of Maria Montessori to Bob Keegan at Harvard, right? And, and we're going to help everybody become more capable and competent. And then it's that whole Tao Te Ching thing, like the true leader sits on the hillside while the villagers congratulate themselves on their successes down below. So like, that's the jam. Which is why, by the way, like my most cynical, most like if, if I ever come in like super scathing, it's because some dumb fucking, like some big dumb hat fucking conchy cacao ceremony, crystal wearing life coach grows up and sits in the fucking throne themselves, you know, after beginning their Aya journey three fucking years ago. You're like, you're like, we left that seat empty, you ass hat, and it's not for you. Right. <laughs> and, well, and so, yeah. right. So, so in that sense, um, you know, I mean, it, there's an old Grateful Dead tune, you know, that, that, that he, he ends it with like, and if I knew the way I would take you home. And that's kind of, you know, it's how we came up, you know, and, and, and he was the Jerry Garcia as a guitarist and as a, as a transmitter lit up, you know, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of humans with that initiatory experience. And he was explicitly not grabbing the ring or capturing the flag. So like, that's how we came up it was like, was, it was, it was Socratic. It was, it was developmental. It was Montessori based. It was a keto based. It was a thousand things. It was outdoor, you know, guiding where if people fixated on you, you did it wrong. If they were parroting what you thought you hadn't taught them to think, you know, if you'd created dependency rather than independence, that was a violation of the, pr of the purpose. Absolutely. So, I get that, you know, in, in the age of Instagram self-promotion, et cetera, that is, you know, staggeringly <laughs> rare these days. I, it baffles me that we're not more on that together. Um, everybody's just rushing in to take the claim, skip, skip the apprenticeship, 
fuck the lineage, you know, I, and hang out well, there on shingle. I, I, yeah, I, I, I get that. I get that. And that's, that's a consistent theme that I perceive to animate you. It's, it's a curious position for you because, and I'm, you know, I'm no one to say this again from, to my perception, it seems like you should be <laughs> one of those people who is guiding people who wish to lead, you know, and I, and I mean that, but it's also the case that, you know, it looks like one of the most popular business models is, you know, training the trainer. And so in the context of exactly what you speak to, it is, I, I do, I, so, so it's one of the things that sort of animated me and I've, um, I'll just speak to this because I, it was a, yeah, it was just a relational thing. It's, it's, it's nothing at all, but I was um, sitting outside on a balcony once when you were speaking in conversation on a, online to a man named Jiro Taylor. I, it was in 2000 and, January 2019. It was the only time I've met Jiro. I stayed with him for a night. I just reached out to him and I was um, nearby a couple of hours away. And I was, you know, he had that call and I, I, I went inside. And I was like, ha, ah, interesting. I wonder if I'll get the opportunity to speak to Jamie one day. And I probably thought to myself, yeah, it feels like, it feels like I will. I thought that was with me at that time. And it still is. And it's been part of the work I'm doing, wanting to do, have done, want to do, continue to do. It's never done. All of that is to be part of creating contexts where The field, the field is one that both can welcome many lineages as well as welcome those who have been so fractured in relating to any one lineage that here we are speaking for myself here. I was not raised in one lineage, you know, and I haven't found myself at home in any one lineage, mm -hmm. but who can, who can come together and speak the Logos, speak with each other without reference to script, without need to depend on any one particular figure, but in such a way and to try and create the kind of context that can make apparent when people are showing up in, in your language, let's say, you know, on the kind of path associated with the scripts that people might think unconsciously makes it more likely for them to be able to grab the one ring of power. It seems like, you know, I've been, I've been trying on a couple of times to kind of in insinuate with the kind of imply the lack of the kind of communicational contexts that can hold the, for the field to hold to account, for the field to hold to account the integrity of the voice. That's part of what field, I'm trying to, other people, the second person field, other people, the energy, the presence, the integrity with which people bring themselves to relationship, you know, to not speak forward in some context would might be to, you know, I suppose at the like the at like the catastrophic end of it would be to betray trust or something like this, right? You know, if there's something if you're called and you're feeling like it's like it's a like it's appropriate and called to speak, then then you do, and that's part of the field holding, right? right? No, I mean, look, like, like like you're sort of it seems like you are speaking around and or imagining all sorts of things that are kind of actually the, the kinds of things we do in our own in our community. So like when we have like right it, you know so i was going to ask you that i was going to ask what are yeah. your experiences with these types of things and is this part of how you're relating to for instance the next book because these are the kinds of these are the kinds of um these are the questions these are the inquiries like this is the this is the kind of the the undercurrent of the meta inquiry and praxis of building that i'm 
part in service to and other things. And I'm curious how you relate to that. I'm curious how, I mean, it's in so many ways, that's why I'm kind of sharing it. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, I'm just, just trying to sharpen the question because I mean, I could, you, you were covering a lot of ground there. How, how to kind of create shared experiences and establish norms that help create a congruent container without it getting not just not just the how no I'm, I'm kind of interested in what's at the edge of what you don't understand about that as it relates to questions of scale i'm interested what in what you do but i'm also interested in what you don't you know i don't understand why it's so fucking hard i don't understand why people put it in the ditch so early in the game I don't understand how people are even fucking functioning, given how little pressure it appears to require to crack them. Um, I don't understand why people regress to their lizard brains, given just a hit of ecstasis or peak states or experiences. Um, I don't understand how hungry ghosty uh, people are these days. I don't think it's everyone's fault. I think it's, you know, it's, it's our sort of digital media perverse incentives ecosystem. It's creating a whole lot of arguably like dark triad behaviors out of people that actually would never test as dark triad. So we're getting many, much more sociopathic extracted behavior, much more narcissistic self-reflection, much more transactional, you know, kind of living and, and treating in each other. Um, I mean, we teach maybe one tenth of what we have experienced and believe to be true because we just never get there it's like mm. being a shopping mall fucking sensei and you're forever teaching white belts first first form first form you know you're like jesus mm. christ really because like there is a five finger death punch but you know the people who come to you saying hey i want to i've heard all about it i think you might know give me the five finger death punch we're like no fuck you you're a lifestyle coach you know, looking to spin up your little fucking Tantra workshop next month, you know, like you don't. And that's something that in that braiding sweetgrass that a Ojibwe woman uh, writes about, she writes about elders and how if you would go to the elders and approach in the wrong, in the wrong way, with the wrong attitude, the wrong time, without the appropriate processes or ceremonies, they'd just be like, yeah, window down, nothing to tell you, you know, and we have felt that way. Um, typically unattached men, <laughs> is is classically the one um but then you also get relative levels of stability psychological stability you get people that you would have thought would be rock solid they're doctors they're somebody else and they give them just a little boost of juice and suddenly their entire world is upside down and you know in my 20s and 30s i was much more like a super stoked peter pan pied piper you know, I'd be like, this is fucking awesome. Come with me. You know, you got to check this out. Right. And then having had, you know, surprisingly hairball experiences where not everybody does well in those realms, you know, in the big surf, in the big mountains and whatever it is, you know, and, and the metaphysical variants of it, you're like, oh, okay. Make haste slowly. Um, never mind. I mean, at this point I'm, I'm anticipating quite likely going to my grave with the overwhelming majority of what and because having always been a guide and, an, and and a teacher and instructor like i cannot like the moment i see something i then see the sort of zeros and ones behind it like here's all the the references the lineages the the, the, the history the the, the, the signs like J -j 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 -j. and then it's almost instantly and here's how you teach it or here's how you chunk it down into some interesting concepts and that you know it, at times where i'm vague or i'm boring or confusing that's still 100 percent on me but there is this it, i can't help but always see things as you would share things and there's so much that we barely rarely speak of because it's not helpful and or it's distracting or distorting and that's not that's not a great surprise right i mean every tradition i mean i think that there's there's versions of the kabbalah that they would never teach to any man who wasn't over the age of 40 and married and you're like yeah that makes total sense because under the age of 40 and not and single does not need to glimpse the ring does not need to understand incantations and words of power right wrong person so 
you know, um, we'll see. I mean, honestly, I would say I am, I said it before, but I'm, I'm sort of heartbroken and not out of fucks, but kind of. And so my current feeling is we're going over the falls and the barrel we're in, we're dressed exactly how we're dressed. There's no re there's no retooling democracy. There's no reinventing capitalism that no, this is who we fucking are. We've been at it a while and we're going to run smack dab into the buzzsaw of this future at full tilt, exactly as who we are. Therefore, I am going to savor every moment. I'm going to love the ones I'm with and I'm going to continue to make art because I can't help it. Right. And, and, and so that's my commitment. It's, it's, it will not be backing off making the most beautiful things that I can in this world. And whether that's a series of amazing turns down a down a couloir, you know, in the spring, being like, fuck yeah, climbed it, nailed it. That look at that. That is gorgeous. A little bit of kinetic sand painting. Or it's a book, you know, or it's trippy ass children's stories, you know, or whatever. So that's where I am. I mean, I mean, David Data is is, is a is a buddy and we typically exchange cynical and salty text with each other from time to time <clears throat> and you know writing recaps of the rapture he was like he's like because he was even an early reader of it and, and he was kind of like oh so you it's kind of cute you know you still have this kind of get up and go you're still trying to actually change some of this shit you know and he's like don't don't you realize there's just god and death that waits for us all and i'll be like oh come on I, I still have some gas in the tank you know like I'm, I'm willing to take a crack at this and um you know three four years later Turns out you did run out of gas, eh? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, you got a bit of gas left. I mean, I mean, yes, but also massively shrunken in my sense of what is possible other than what's going to be. Yeah. And you can call that surrender. You can call that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Apathy, you can call that broken heartedness, you can call that realism, you can call it whatever. Um, but I would say that my last effort to attempt to, and, and I think for me, I don't like the word scale either. I mean, I've often said like all the things that matter in this world aren't scalable. You know, intimacy, love, connection, care, concern, there's not an app for any of them. So I prefer ripples to scale, you know, because it's more organic and it's that sense of like, ah, oh, now if such a graha, if soul force articulated in an individual, in a community, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bit of music, in a song, why don't you name it? That sends ripples through time and space. And that I remain forever sort of curious about, intrigued by, attentive to, hopeful for, you know, is how do we just fucking rock it on the soul force level? And I think the more we, you know, memento mori, the more we remember we all die the more we, you know, is that, um, what is it? I think it's Heraclitus, but it was quoted by Terence McKenna, where he says, nothing lasts, nothing lasts, nothing lasts, and nothing is lost. Mm. I think that's kind of where I'm spending my time. Mm. Yeah. No, I feel that it's interesting how uh, it manifests differently in the different moments of life. Glass half full realism is essentially what I'm hearing. At least that's how I've described myself at various times. Because at the end of the day, it's how we affirm where we are, who we are, as we are. What are you going to do? You know, it's up to you, really. And that is where the magic is. And so, hey... Gandalf says it best, eh? I'm not as good as you as uh, nailing quotes. There's part of me, I'm not practiced enough, so I have to step into the scripted part of the brain and I have to be like, all right, what exactly did Gandalf say, even though you've said it 15 times before? It matters not... See, I can't do it, but I know it. Mm, nice. It ma <laughs> Well, just paraphrase this. It's, it's like how people who stutter can actually whisper and they don't stutter um i used to stutter me. as a kid hmm. as a as a baby i used to stutter 
the point is that is what we do with the time that's given to us. Mm. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. So, absolutely. You know, it's very much in the spirit of that that I meet you and with a necessary kind of enthusiasm for and an energy. An energy of a energy and responsibility of a thirty two year old man who doesn't have mm -hmm. kids, but hopefully one day, right? Hopefully mm -hmm. one day soon is um what there is to do. And so I know that um our time together is not much longer today. Thank you for sharing yours for the sake of the artifact. One question that I did want to ask, which I won't ask now, maybe one day in the future. I am curious how, and it comes through in what you've said, but I would be curious to explore for the fun of it, you know. And there's a pointed aspect, a critically pointed aspect with respect to how this kind of thinking manifests and influences culture and justification and power and authority and all of that. But I, I am curious about your interest in the work of uh, Teilhard de Chardin. Mm -hmm. And I know that comes through a lot in what, in what you're saying in terms of even Kairos and you didn't mention Kronos, but the relation between the two. And, uh, you know, and there are some big unknowns. There's some beautiful mysteries, some which may be revealed in part and others which will always remain so unrevealed which seem to point in the direction of the manner by which this internal and external across time are in fact in the kind of connection that could make sense of your saying and nothing is lost. The way memory plays out over landscapes and time and deep pattern and all these things and telos and all of this and how we can be part of realizing that together and contributing and participating in the realization of telos all of that is is a beautiful direction but maybe not for today i'll just leave it open to you if you want to share any closing words although i think you have i just thank you again yeah i mean i, feel, I sort of feel like we're sort of we're all beringians now you know, like, like that land bridge between Asia and the Americas, right? And, and you know, research is getting us further and further back. It was 11,000, now it's 15, 22,000, whatever. But like a tiny group of humans made an impossible journey in incredibly harsh conditions to seed a new world. And from that came everything, right, that we are. And so as we approach constraints, as we approach grieving the loss of you know, whatever we want to call it, <laughs> late stage modernity. Um, let's, you know, let's remember we are the keepers of the spark, of the ember, of the flame. And all we have to do is just create a punk, you know, just a little glowing coal you know, through sleet and snow and dead of night, right? All we got to do is keep that little fucker going so that our children's children can blow it back into a flame and, you know, and warm themselves and dance around the fire. So like, to me, that's the game. That's really what it comes down to at this point. If it's anything simpler and easier and less dramatic than that, bonus, <laughs> you know, but if it turns out to be that, that much of a kind of nails experience, then we're ready for it. And we know what matters most. So let's sing our war songs. Let's sing our love songs. You know, let's stay awake and build stuff, you know, and absolute worst case scenario, go out with a bang best case scenario pay it forward thank you Jamie